So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, my name is Jean-Georges Perrine. Uh, I'm, I'm French. Uh, I live in the U.S. right now. Uh, I've got a very specific connection to Ireland because the funny accent you're kind of hearing right now is not French, it's Irish. This is where I learned English. So, uh, I've, been, uh, I've been building software for a long time, and um, I'm an IBM champion, which means that I'm one of the 400 most seen people in the IBM community, and I've been doing that for nine years. Uh, my motto is keep learning, and my blog is at jgp.net. Um, before we get started, uh, I brought, I brought Mr. Bear uh, because my, my, my girlfriend and I, we have four kids. And they were really upset that we were living for Ireland. Um, so I, I, I need your help to, to shout them hello from you guys. Okay, so I'm going to film you and you're going to shout. Ready? Three, two, one. Okay, I'm pretty sure you can do better than that, okay? Three, two, one. Thank you so much, guys. So let's get started because we have a lot of content to do. Um, I'd like to know a little bit about you as well. So who is a Java programmer? Awesome! <laughs> who swears by Scala? Okay, you see the green signs there? <laughs> It's not too late. Uh, who has already tried to build a custom data source? Okay, not that many. Who has tried in Java? A little less. Who has succeeded? Okay, so, well, you probably won't learn that much here then, sorry. But it's very difficult. Um, so basically, my problem was that. I, I know a little bit about Spark. Um, I've been trying to ingest CSV and JSON on RDBMS without any problem. But for a customer of mine, I needed to import REST. I needed REST to come in, okay? And also source as well. So how, how, did I, how could you do that? Um, the first reflex you have is look at sparkpackages.org, okay? Uh, there's something like 48 different data sources listed there, some duplicates with what is exactly in the core, in the, in the, in the, in the product already, and some with source code. Most of them are in Scala, uh, and I need Java. So the thing is, I didn't have much of a choice. I had to write it myself and in Java. And so I had to look into what is ingestion, what is ingestion, and I didn't dig as much as my previous speaker, uh, but really, uh, I, it was easy to load CSV and all those things, but I, w I really I wanted to load all those things and really get a data frame. Okay, really is a data set of rows we all love. Okay, with this data, with your data. Uh, so basically, uh, the lab we're going through here is I'm going to import some of the metadata of my photos or yours uh, and start some basic analysis on that. Okay, so look at the metadata and import all of that. So that's kind of what the code I want to produce, OK? So I want to, from my Spark session, call the read method, give it the uh, format method with my specific data source, and I have the different options, OK? So be careful about the options, because they, are really, they, have, they have really uh, a meaning there, OK? And actually, the load, uh, uh, which also is and the import directory or the path actually to your data, um, which is actually an option. Okay, you, you will see that in the code. It's it's an option. So options are really important. You can have a short name, as you see, as you saw in the previous slide. I had a short name called exif, but it's optional. You can you can specific you can specifically put a class name, and Spark uh, will dynamically load it. So the, the the short name is really just an alias to a bigger name. It needs to be registered. I'm going to show you how to do that. Uh, but I'm not recommending this in, during development phase, OK? When you're in development phase and you're trying to understand where things can go wrong, well, I'm kind of a, I'd like people to, uh, to be able to debug. So I'm not recommending at this stage. So this is my project. Uh, all of the source code can be downloaded uh, under an Apache 2 license from, uh, 
from uh, GitHub. Um, and so it looks like a pretty simple uh, Java project, okay? You've got your application, photo metadata ingestion app. You've got, um, um, sorry, you've got the, the service definition, which is actually listing the short name, the path of the short name. The short name is in this default source 22.java. Um, the data source itself is in a, in a, in a data source file, and we're going to go through all these things, so don't worry if you don't read all of it in details. Uh, basically, then you've got the relation, and after the, you've got, you may have already the code to import that, right? I did not, for the, for the sample of our lab, I did not rewrite an exif uh, reader and parser, okay? So I used something, um, this is here, and the last thing is I've got, a, of course, a bunch of small utilities we're also going to go through. So, the library code. As I said, it's something you may already have. It's something you want to reuse. It's something that is being developed by another, another part of the group. Uh, another uh, and you don't really, you don't, you don't care that much. And sometimes you cannot really modify it. Okay, so there's no need for anything special there. So, it's just, it's just a library code that is going to actually read the files or read the format you actually want to import. Here is my data source. I've removed a few lines, but not that much, and you see it's actually pretty short. Uh, so what you can see here, it's, uh, it's, impl it's implementing a relation provider, um, which is what Spark will, will require. It's returning a base relation, uh, which, is, which we're going to study in, in, a, in just the next slide. And you need to have the SQL context being passed to it, and, and also to the relation. Okay, so the SQL context needs to go to go through to the end to the end of our processing. Then, all the options I mentioned just before. Okay, you see them as this map string string of params. In this situation, when it comes to my create relation, it's it's in Scala. Okay, so I need to transform this from Scala to Java, and this is being done by this uh, little function here, map as Java converter, which is, not, which is provided by Scala, and you automatically inherit it from, from, from Spark. So, and finally, you return the relation that is going to be exploited. The relation is a bit, uh, is really the plumbing. Okay, it's really the part which is going to link Spark to your existing library or to your existing code. So the mission is very simple. It has to return a schema as a struct type and returns data as an RDD of rows. Okay, which are the basic elements to build the data frame from. So let's look at the code for the relation a little bit. And this, this was actually the, the trickiest one when, when I was implementing this thing. So, the, the, as, as, you saw, as you saw before, we're returning a base relation. So, we extend the base relation, which is also, like a lot of objects within Spark, implements serializable and also the stable scan, okay? The stable scan will force us to get the build scan and uh, the schema. So this are, and of course, the SQL, the SQL context, okay? So we, we need to be able to return the SQL context as well. So basically, we don't do anything with this one uh, unless you want to modify it. The schema is, um, is important because uh, I've seen in different cases that either the schema or the ball scan can be called independently, and there's no relation between the two, okay? So if it may create some problems when you're actually building your data source because the schema can be read before your, your build scan and vice versa. So you need to be careful in your own code to make sure that this order is, is not, um, is, is can, can, be, can be called in any way, okay? So build scan and schema, which are really the two, fu the two functions which we detail now. So the schema, is a simple struct type, okay? Uh, in, this, in this scenario, I've added a, a kind of a, uh, and we'll detail that a little bit, um, 
a converter from a classic Java bean to uh, uh, a schema, and this schema can actually then get returned as a Spark schema. So it's something pretty, pretty simple in this situation. The relation, uh, the data itself, so the both scan method, is um, also pretty, pretty easy, pretty easy to, to follow. Um, what I've done here is um, I've actually isolated the collect data in another method, which is collect data, uh, and you can see it just underneath. Uh, you can see that just the first thing I'm calling is a schema to make sure that my schema is actually up to date. And then you can see that I've got my library call, okay? Uh, and my library call is just this exif utils process from file name, getting the file name, get its absolute path, whatever, and get all these things together directly into a list. And this list is being returned to the relation, to the both scan method of the relation. So this one is actually, and then I'm using this simple, uh, this simple way to load the data from, from my list, parallelized into um, my Java RDD. And from that, I'm just returning, I'm just returning the, the RDD. So that's basically the core of the code. So once I've built my, my data source, which we just did, uh, I can look at the application, okay? And if you look at the very beginning, all my imports, I have no link. I did not import anything from my, from my data source, okay? So my new data source is here, is available for everyone to be used directly within Spark. I don't need to specify anything at the application level. I'm creating, uh, here in this, in this application, I'm creating uh, a session in local mode, classic way. Uh, and then I'm exactly the same code as I showed you before. I have my classic read. Once I have my data frame with all the metadata of my photos, well, what I can actually do is um, play, with, with play with it, okay? I can actually have some analytics um, running on it. So as you can imagine, okay, I'm getting uh, my data frame, I'm filtering on making sure that my geolocation, my X geolocation is not null, that my GOZ is not equal to none, and I'm going to sort by the highest pictures to the lowest pictures. So when I, when I run this code, um, uh, sorry, and of course, after that, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm outputting the, the results as you, as you would expect. Like I have my df.count, I've got my sprint schema, I'm showing the five first uh, rows of my, of my data set. So if you look at the output, here uh, I was not expecting to have such a big screen, so it's almost readable, uh, but I zoomed in to what, to what seemed interesting. Uh, and you've got the name of the file, the size, and the, um, the GPS coordinates, as well as the date it was taken. Um, in the original metadata, I've got, I've got plenty of other things, and if you look at the code, it's really easy to extend if you want to extend afterwards. One lesson uh, that, that I was remembered, it's not the first time, but I was remembered this one, uh, was that you need to check out uh, about your data. Uh, so I looked at this file name, so which was on the, the second one on the, top, on the top list, and image 016, um, sorry, 0176 uh, was actually to take, being taken from one of my sons in Rotterdam, uh, which we all know is not very high, right? So I was really uh, a little bit worried about, okay, is my algorithm correct? What, what's going on? And that's kind of the only pictures I was seeing. So it was, this one it was actually nine feet above sea level, or two meters. Fortunately, by digging a little bit more, 
I found that the right one had the same name, but it was a little higher, so something like 30,000 feet, um, so almost um, a little bit over nine kilometers high. And this is a picture when, when I w then I was going to Las Vegas uh, of Lake Mead and Hoover Dam. So data quality is always something we need to check and think about. So to I, I, when I built this thing, I, I wanted to make sure that it would be kind of reusable um, to many different kinds of beans, okay? Um, and so I looked into how can I introspect um, my Java to make sure that I can reuse this component for any kind of Java beans. So basically, if you are if you have anything, you can just take the code, replace the photo code, and put your code in. So that's, that, was, that was the idea, okay? So you take, you take your Java bean um, here. You can, if you want, you can augment it via a, an annotation which I call Spark column, uh, which you can force a type, you can force if it's required, force a column name. Um, and this uh, is actually just two output of it, as we saw before. The first one is a schema. Um, it's a specific schema. It's not directly the struct type in this situation, because as we all know, the struct type is pretty, um, is pretty limited. Okay? You've got the type, you've got if it's required, you've got the name. Uh, you don't have much other stuff, and it's not really extensible. So basically, I had to build this additional schema and from which I can actually extrapolate the, 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 the Spark schema. And I've got the second output of this bean, which is really the data. So now, now that we've got this, this situation, we, um, we, can go, we can go mass production, okay? We can, in, we can easily import any Java beans, um, you can, we can do the conversion with data with simple utilities, and the schema I built is a superset of the struct type. So if you want to enrich it by adding all the constraints, well, you feel free to do it. So, as a conclusion, is uh, you don't have to reinvent everything. You can just reuse a bean and the schema and the project. Uh, include that in your project. You can. Um, build custom data sets very easily. Uh, you can connect to REST services. That was my first use case. And then you can have the specific file formats you may want to import. Um, there is no need for this pricey conversion, OK? Uh, a lot of, when we started, when we embarked on that, um, the first thing we, we wanted to do is, oh, OK, if we, if we fail in building this data source, what we're going to do is extract the data, convert it to CSV or JSON, and then uh, import it and just ingest it in Spark. But if we do that, that's pricey, and it, it requires a lot of disk space, et cetera. So, um, so we, 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 we went this way. Um, there is um, one of the conclusions as well is, for so far, there's always a way. To, there's always a solution in Java. Uh, you don't need to look at other languages to, to build your stuff with, with Spark. So far, it has been worked out pretty well. Um, however, what's left on you uh, on this project is uh, check how good it works in parallelism, optimization, and maybe extend the schema. Like right now, the, the order of columns is not supported. So if you want to go further, uh, the, the code can be, can be downloaded, take pictures, or you get the slide soon. You can follow me. You can ask questions. Uh, I will be delighted to answer the question. Um, and um, I'm a fervent believer of uh, Java and Spark. And um, I'm currently in the process of writing a book um, that will be published soon, hopefully. And if you come ever any time to the RTP area in North Carolina, please give, us, give me a call. Uh, so thank you. I'm up for questions. I went a little fast. I hope I was not too fast. I will not try to pronounce that in Irish, but thank you all.
Thank you, John Well, we have 10 minutes, so if you're not hungry and dying for coffee, there's a mic on either side of the aisle. Please feel free to uh, uh, put your questions to John Jord or what you heard about today. I guess you're dying for coffee, are you? <laughs> Going once. The gentleman walking up to the mic, hopefully. Good. Hi, I got Hi. a question. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, if you would compare building a spark source uh, to a Hadoop input format, could, could you maybe elaborate a bit on the difference and benefits you get by a Spark data source? I can't. <laughs> uh, I, I'm this generation of people where I learned, and I think I was pretty good at what was RDBMS, I saw the Hadoop coming in, I never really believed in it, and then when I saw Spark coming a few years ago, I jumped on a Spark bandwagon. So, any Hadoop comparison, uh, it's better in Spark. That's my answer. <laughs> Sorry. Anybody else? Okay, one more round for George John. Thank you. We'll see you back here in 20 minutes after coffee break.